Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Evelyn Marcus. And I am Phyllis Zimbler miller It's been a year since the October 7 massacre, and many people and organizations have undertaken projects to offset the devastation of that massacre. Today we have one of one such guest, Baruch Appesdorf the founder of Let's Do Something, whose organization is in memory of his best friend, David Newman, who was murdered on October 7th last, <clears throat> last year. Baruch, welcome to our show and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. On October 7th, you and some other friends drove south to try to rescue your friend David Newman and his girlfriend. Can you tell us what you did on October 7th? Um, yeah. So little backdrop uh, just to that. On, uh, on October 6th, Dave and I were, were very close friends, but also roommates. And we we're sitting there Friday afternoon before Shabbat. And he asked to borrow my car to go to a party. So I said, of course, not a problem. Just need you to drop me off at my parents' house in Jerusalem, it was the Chagim, Simchat Torah is coming up, my sister is visiting from the States. So we went to Jerusalem together, uh, ended up getting out of the car over there, gave him a hug, basically said, I love you, I'll see you tomorrow. And he drove off. And then Shabbat morning, I wake up, as so many of us did, uh, to the sound of sirens. And one of the first things I did was text David, and I just wrote a simple, innocent text, I hope you're up north. I didn't know where the party was, I didn't know where he was, but I wanted to check in. And an hour or two later, David ended up responding, um, pray for me. So I was a bit confused. You know, there wasn't that much news out. I didn't fully understand what was going on. And I was just like, David, it's just rockets. You know, this is normal. I'm not freaking out. What do you mean pray for you? You're like, what's happening? And that's when he told me that him and his girlfriend, Noam, and a bunch of other people were hiding in a dumpster at the Nova site from terrorists that had gone into our country. Um, so that's when I, I really started to understand what was going on that day. And basically what happened then was I have uh, two friends. Their name is Gidon and Ezra. Both of them were combat medics in the army. And we all connected and we were like, we have to go get David. And even when we were thinking about that, we were thinking maybe there are five terrorists in the country, 10 terrorists in the country. We couldn't possibly comprehend what was really happening. Um, but we stopped to go donate blood grabbed my sister's car. Then we went to another friend's house. We got guns. We got bulletproof vests. And we started driving down south. And at 10.45 a.m., I got one last text message from David. And he just said, uh, pray for me now. And that ended up being the last message I received from him. We drove down south. And the further south we got, the more we were understanding that there was a serious problem in our country, but not really sure what exactly? And as we approached Ashkelon and then uh, where Stay Road and 232, a very important uh, road on that day, meets, um, there was an army uh, barrier set up. And basically they said, you can't go past here. But uh, Gidon and Ezra, because they're combat medics, were able to get out and hop in an ambulance with the goal of getting to Nova. But they got in there and maybe 30 seconds went by before they're on the street. And they just started finding bodies everywhere, people injured. And that entire day, Shabbat, Saturday, October 7th, Guido and Ezra are going back and forth on 232, trying to help people. And I was on the phone with David's family. I'd lost contact with David. I'm outside over there. Do you have any information? And then later in the afternoon, we got a text, a call around four o'clock from his brother saying, Noam has been killed. David is alive. And then later that day, got a text message that said, David is killed, Noam is alive. So it was complete chaos. We didn't know what was going on. And we got home Saturday night. And while obviously there was a ton of terrible news, uh, we thought David could still be alive. And that was really our Saturday. It was, it was traumatic and we saw things we never wanted to see. But we got home and there was still this, you know, David might be with us um, energy. And we Dead woke way. up... Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, October 8th, and it was really 
it was really the exact same experience all over again. There was more news in saying that that David had been killed, but uh, David is this huge, beautiful guy, long blonde hair, 6'3", jacked. And when I picture David in a situation like this, I imagined him, you know, walking out of Gaza, and like, guys, everything is okay, don't worry. And it was hard to face that reality. So we drove down south again, looking for him. And we went to a hospital called Barzilai, which is in Ashkelon. We heard there are a lot of bodies from Nova there. And there was literally there, I'll never forget that day, there was a freezer truck. And that freezer truck was full of bodies, but no David. So we continued down south and we got to the same intersection at 232 and stay roads. And there was still a block up from the army saying you cannot go past here. But it is Israel. So we made a left and a right and we went around. And we start driving down 232, and the scenes there are what they were. And we got to a certain point, and I drove by a car that was just a second before then hit by a rocket, a mortar, a missile. I have no idea, no experience with the war zone, but it freaked me out. It scared me, and I didn't know what to do, and I just kind of drove right by it. I sped by it, and we go down this road, and it's just silence, and it's empty now. And... I think we're running into an ambush and we're sitting there in the car and I turned to the guys in the car. There were three of us, you don't Ezra and Moshe. And I say, guys, David is dead. If we continue down this road, we are going to die. We're going home. And I turned us around and we drove home and we got home Sunday evening and maybe an hour or two after we got home, somebody sent a picture on WhatsApp and there was a field. And in that field was uh, a pile of bodies and we're able to identify David based off the shirt that I lent him to the party. And that was how those two days, and that's our agenda. It's a terrible story, um, Baruch. Um, and um, so, I mean, how are you doing now, a year later? Um, it's, it's Especially since today is a great... Uh, right. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a slow processor emotionally and yesterday was I don't even know how to describe yesterday. I left my house at about 4:45 in the morning. Um to give you the full story and I only learned the exact details of this yesterday and I'll tell you but David was at the party with his girlfriend Noam and they tried to leave the party at around 8:30 but it was already blocked by terrorists at the entrance and there was a huge traffic jam so they returned to the party and they found a dumpster and no one was hiding in there and david was there and there were 14 other people hiding in that dumpster and david was always relaxed and everyone talks about him that he was just making sure that everyone was okay and checking in on noam and he just said to her hide in the back hide in the back and meanwhile he was talking to his friends in the army trying to organize for people to come save them and just telling everyone it's going to be okay. And he was always in the front, checking on everyone, being on lookout. And at exactly 11.47 a.m., this is after they were there for hours, a terrorist heard something, spotted something. We don't know what. But uh, he got up and he went to the front of the dumpster. And David, as always, was right there in the front. And David was shot immediately in the chest and killed. And the bullet, uh, the dumpster was sprayed with bullets and nine other people in that dumpster were killed. Noam survived, but uh, she was shot as well. And she has been through an incredible journey of resilience and recovery over the past year. And she is an amazing, amazing human being and truly the, the epitome of inspiration and, uh, you know, Jewish beauty and just we will dance again and i went down south with her to nova to be there at 6 29 a.m the exact time the music stopped at the very dumpster where david was killed and they turned it into a memorial um and as we were driving down that road yesterday morning at 6 29 i saw two rockets in the air coming from gaza and to me it was just such a stark message and reminder to me, that was a uh, that was Hamas saying to us that we will not stop until you're dead. That's what the statement was. And there was a lot that day because you look at Noam and Noam is the epitome of their failure. Anyone they should have succeeded with, it should have been with Noam, but they didn't. They failed and they'll continue to fail. And while yesterday was so hard and so much to process from there, 
in the end of the day, we're here. We're not going away. Noam is here. She's not going away. And that's what I try to take from this. Yesterday, I looked at one of those dumpsters at the Nova Music Festival exhibit here in Los Angeles. So yeah. I can very clearly visualize what you're talking about. The pot of porta potties that were shot with all the bullets. Mm -hmm. The exhibit is just an amazing thing. It's been extended from ending today. This is a little plug for the exhibit to the 20th. I, anyone listening who can get to Los Angeles really needs to see this amazing exhibit. Not that we can ever really, how should I say this, um, experience what those people experience, but this is an exhibit that creatively shares that information. And when I texted friends from the exhibit saying you have to see it, they said, I don't have the heart. I don't have the courage. But it's, I just want to say on our show, it's not, you don't have to look at the brutal things or you can look at the brutal things. So I really encourage people to, to go to the exhibit and read some of the people who died that chose to save other people and die rather than escape. I mean, it's an amazing story of heroism also. Which brings and, me and, to what you yeah. decided to do. Yeah. Um, and just on that note, for people, um, it's not pretty to see that stuff. Nobody wants to see it, but it's so important because that gets seared in your head and it makes you remember. And I grew up, as all of us did, on Holocaust education. I'll never forget. But it was black and white for me. It wasn't reality. Um, and when you experience something like that and it becomes your reality, it changes your life and people need to understand. And the only way to understand something is to experience something. And I just want to say the creativity that when you leave the exhibit into a big room with the gift shop and Coke in, there are little seats so that you can kind of just process with Kleenex boxes. And I've never seen that before. And I just think that's such an appreciation of what we all have to do about processing this. Yeah. yeah, and and yeah. what strikes me, Baruch, is the strength uh, you and Noam are um, expressing um, uh, one year later. That's that's unbelievable, and and very inspiring. Yeah. So back to let's do something. Um. So. As you can imagine, going through those experiences a year ago, and it's weird to say a year ago, but I, I got home Sunday night and I was shell-shocked. I, I don't even know how to describe what was going through my mind, but I, I carried a huge amount of guilt with me. I felt like I failed my friend in a very basic sense. And Gidon and Ezra, they're, they're heroes. They save lives. I was just driving. And I felt like I, I, I let David down and I, I let our people down and I couldn't sleep that night. And I come from a background working in nonprofit management. I worked for Gift of Life, an incredible bone marrow registry for many, many years. And I just stayed up that whole night. And I'm 26 years old. So I had a lot of friends texting, reaching out. They're called up for reserves. They need this. They need that. So I started up writing documents, compiling Excel sheets of what they're asking. And I opened up a, a WhatsApp group in the middle of the night called Let's Do Something. I put some of my best friends in it. And I was just like, we need to do something. We need to help. And that's what we started doing. And I have a close friend whose mother lives on Long Island. His name is Ike Bodner. Um, his mother generously converted her house into a warehouse. We sent out Excel sheets to all of New York of what we needed, reached out to everyone in the world and somehow got in touch with some of the right people. And by that night, we had tens of thousands of pounds of stuff that we requested dropped off at our house. We categorized it, organized it, and shipped it out on a cargo flight to Israel the very next day. And it arrived Tuesday, 7 p.m. at the exact same time as David's funeral. And I remember this moment incredibly clearly. We were sitting there in Yidon's apartment. It had been days without sleep, days without eating, incredibly stressful. And we had that moment where we were like, do we go deal with this flight or do we go to David's funeral? And we were just like, we have to go to David's funeral. And we did. And then essentially we got back to work. And we ended up opening a warehouse in Petah Tikva, right outside of uh, Tel Aviv, close to the airport, partnering up with a ton of incredible people, started distributing the aid. One flight turned into five, five turned into 10. We got in touch with a lot of large companies, distributors, and just started bringing in aid for Israel en masse over essentially the first six months of the war. 
And that was how my first six months went. And honestly, I don't even, especially the first couple of months, uh, remember a lot of what was happening. It was this uh, chaos slash um, grief infused just action and energy of we need to do something. And it was how I dealt with it. And that's what we did. But six months in, this wasn't an easy life. We all quit our jobs. We all put our lives on hold. And we sat there and we talked for a little bit. And we were like, is this something that we actually want to do? Uh, and after talking for a long time, we decided yes. And then the question was, how can we really help? And that's where we really built out to what the organization does to today and our long-term plan with it, which is we work on three pillars, which is defense, healing, and advocacy. And I could get into each of those, but the idea really there is help us at all three stages. Advocacy helps us before these issues come up, before anti-Semitism takes over or prevents it. Defense is these wars and these battles happen and people need help and it's there for them. And healing is afterwards. There's incredible amount of collective trauma out there and people need support. And that's where we want to be. And we want to be there for those people. So let me clarify. <laughs> you have a website. I'm sorry, Evelyn, if I, you have a website and you'll give us the URL and we'll include it here. It's let's do something, right? Dot let's com. do something.com. And as yeah. you said, it's a 501c3 in the United States. Which and means that it is. Okay. So, so people can donate. What, what, yeah. Okay. So keep going, but I wanted to make it clear. No, that 501c3. We can help. What is a 501c3? Oh, <laughs> that is a registered nonprofit organization with the U.S. government, which means any donor um, who is generous enough to contribute to the mission can receive a tax receipt uh, and do what they need with that. OK, so um, thank you. Can donate tax free to your um, exactly to your uh, organization. So what, what what can you mention some projects um, within those three categories? So I'll go through them kind of one by one in the defense space. This is led up uh, by Ike Bodner. Ike worked for a defense drone technology company uh, before the war. And due to some incredible partners that I can't really get into the details of, we're able uh, to build out a drone training and protection unit for and in collaboration with the Army to help get drone pilots and new drones into the Army system to protect people. And the extension of that has been and is becoming a program where essentially problems arise all the time in the field. And the Army is an incredible organization that protects us all, but it is a giant behemoth. It is a bureaucratic beast, and it works very slowly to solve new problems. So what we try to do is work from the ground up to figure out what those problems are, connect it to the right engineering units, the right people, fund a proof of concept to get something mm. made and then distribute that to the units that need it. And our really long-term goal here is to cut down that timeline. In our experience over the past year, we've seen too many scenarios and situations where a problem has arisen that hasn't arisen before. A solution was thought of and was implementable, but it simply took too long. And in that time, one person died here or another soldier died over there. And we want to speed up that time and we want to get those solutions implemented because that saved lives. And that's what we've seen over this year. And that's kind of a an inevitable outcome of something that's as large as the Israeli army. And that's really where we feel like we could add so much because we're small, because we could identify those problems and work directly, we could solve them as quickly as possible. That's, that's what we do in the, the defense space in healing. And this is something that's very close to me, very close to Noam. Um, I don't know that much about PTSD. I don't know that much about trauma. I'll be the first to admit it, but I know I have it. And I know how important it is to help people with it. And as we were coming up with this, I see Noam almost every single week. And I was sitting with her. We were sitting with her and we were like, what can we do to help Nova survivors? Noam has been through everything in the Israeli health system. She had to have surgeries, had to go through months of physical recovery emotional, mental, all of it. And he basically said, what can we do for Nova survivors and people recovering that will have the most impact for them? And she responded, super surprising to me. She said nothing in Israel because everyone who I know who's going through it has left the country and is in Thailand. And we're like, okay, that's interesting. 
And we started looking at the numbers and doing the research. And it seems like actually it turns out that about 20,000 Israelis are going to Thailand every month, a huge uptick. And there's a huge number who have relocated there. And we started to connecting to Chabad. And it turns out they're having a crisis of hundreds of people showing up who need real mental, emotional support. And there is no support network at all. And these are primarily young people. People are affected by Nova who are in reserves and people who need it. Um, so like a good Jewish boy, I went to my sister's for Friday night dinner, not so long after that. And I told her about what I learned and her husband he is a, a social worker and getting his master's at the university of Haifa. And he goes to school that Sunday morning. And his professor is talking about how she quit her job since the seventh. She's been volunteering with Nova survivors and she really wants to help them, but it's so hard because so many of the people she's working with have left and gone to Thailand. So he's like, you need to meet. This is crazy. And we met We met, and we sat with her. And basically, she's like, we need to build up a program for group healing to support these people. She had just went to Thailand on a research trip. She put together an event last second. And a couple hundred people showed up in need of support. And I was like, that sounds amazing. But, you know, to build out a whole program over there, it's going to take us six to nine months. We got a fundraise for it. We got to put it together. And her name is Yale Shoshani Ram. She's an incredible, incredible person. Um, and she was like, no, you don't understand. With trauma, the time to act is now. These people need help now. And we kind of went into October 7th mode and mentality. We're like, let's get this thing built. And about two months ago, we sent her and her family. She relocated there, our clinical director. Another incredible person uh, named Segev Ben Shalom. He is our operations director over there. Um, they've relocated there and we actually got this facility up and open and it started running about two weeks ago. And we're also in partnership with the Nova Amuta sending every single quarter, so every three months, someone who goes through a mentorship and training program who survived Nova to go there and be a mentor for others. And our first mentor is flying over there next week. And there was an event for young people on October 7th, Israelis on the island in Thailand. And 1,500 people showed up to this event yesterday. So it is absolutely insane, the numbers and what's going on over there. And just incredible credit to Yael for getting this going so fast. And incredible credit to the community for helping us fundraise and get this off the ground and get it started. And over the past year, that has been one of the highlights for me of truly, I feel like I've seen some of the worst of humanity this year. Um, but with that, I've seen the best too. And I've seen how people have come together from all walks of life and put themselves aside and say, what can I do to help? Let's do something. Let's get it done. And we're a completely grassroots organization founded by a couple of 26 year olds who lost their friend. We don't come from money or people who know people with money or any of that. We just came from a community who wanted help. And that story got passed from hand to hand and just built it from there. And that's what we're doing um, in the healing sector. Wait, let and me the clarify last thing we... something. Can I just clarify something? Yeah. I had read yes. that there were groups going to Thailand. So, you know, forgetting why Thailand, the important part is away from having sirens constantly reminding you. I think people need to understand. They could say to you, well, have a retreat in Israel. But the idea yeah. is someplace where you're not constantly responding to sirens. Yeah. And it's not just sending groups there. It's when you're under, first of all, when you went through extreme trauma on October 7th or in reserves afterwards, and then you're under missile or rocket attack and you're worried about this and you're worried about that, you're getting triggered all the time and you choose to leave for an amount of time. Uh, that's just what happens. And for us, it was so important to be where the people are. So why Thailand is because that's where the people go. And there is something very much to trauma treatment where it's hard to heal, where you're being constantly triggered. But more than that, it's so important that you catch these people while they're there, because when people are gone, they're trying to run away from their problems, but you can't. They catch up with you at a party. They catch up with you when you're doing this or that. And people have situations with drugs, with overdosing, with trauma, with flashbacks, can't sleep, all of it. So we want to be there to help those people to make sure they don't slip off an edge that they can't come back from. from. And most importantly, once they're integrating back into Israel, which we want them to do, that they have a support network over there, that they're set up with Natal or other treatment centers in Israel to make sure that these people just didn't just go run away and now have nobody supporting them. So catch them, 
make sure they're safe, protect them, and then make sure they get back home and they're in a system when they get back. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It's so important. And so what I don't, now we, we, we also, the... we also don't know if, if people will ever, ever get over this. Right. I mean, we hope so, but that's still open. Yeah. Right? What about the third think... advocacy? Yeah. So advocacy is really a natural outgrowth of who we are as young people, as American Israelis. Um, when we want to share something, we share it on Instagram. That's what our generation does. And I think it's a it's a bit of a cliche maybe at this point. But, you know, one thing happened on October 7th and the world's reaction on October 8th was a whole nother tragedy and a battle that needs to be fought. And to me, whether we like it or not, and sometimes we like to deny it, um, opinions are formed and shaped on social media and opinions cement into thoughts. They cement eventually into policy. And those people will also become our policy makers. And we felt like there were so many people and incredible organizations out there talking about why Israel deserves to exist or why, you know, we were here in 1948 or 1967 and this happened or that happened. The facts and facts are so important. But nobody cares about their facts if they don't feel it and they're not listening. So our mentality is open up their ears. And if they don't care, they won't listen. So that's exactly what we do. We focus on engaging content aimed at young people, Americans, 19 to 28 years old. That cohort, their support for Israel has plummeted. It's the youngest, excuse me, it's the worst of any generation we've had in a long time. And those people are going to be the ones who rise in the halls of power. So we need to meet those people again where they are and we need to get to them and make sure that they see our story and us explaining it by facts isn't going to be enough. So we try to make strong, emotional, interesting content that gets them to actually listen for a second. And the other side of that for us is connecting to 18 to 29 year old American Jews as well. When you think about it, and I think about this for myself, I've been in Israel for years, but you know, I called myself a Zionist. I lived a Zionistic life, but I never really thought about it. I never really truly cared until I lost my best friends. That's the simple reality. Now I really understand and I really care. But people shouldn't have to lose their best friend, but they need to connect and they need to care. So we're trying to be a young organization with a face and people behind it that people are just naturally connecting that and connecting to. And that's what we've been able to do. We've been able to, able to build out a network of a couple hundred people across major cities in the US and take that social media content that's reaching millions and millions of people, funnel that into committed doers who really wanna help out and put on events and put these people together in the US to build a young, cool, hip and active network of people who are Zionist and care about Israel because that needs to be fostered and it needs to be supported over time. And yeah. That's amazing too. That's amazing too. And, and, and so many young jewish people in in the western world outside of israel are losing um are losing uh, confidence about being a zionist yes uh, because yeah. they get the pressure from outside you know they are they are disenfranchised um for being a zionist um yes. so it's 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 great that you offer something for young people to be proud of, you know, to join that movement yeah. and, and in a proud way. Um, that's wonderful. And I so think. Go ahead. I was going to say in the coming year, yeah. tell us your wish list. What is it in your, in your wish list besides having people help fund and help work with you? But is, are there programs you haven't gotten off the ground that, that you can't wait to get off the ground? Yeah, I'll tell you about that in a second. Just one important note, I think also for people to understand, you know, we see the hates, the hate on the streets. We see it around the world. Um, but something that's so hard to pay attention to is silence. And out of silence is problems really start. And I've seen this personally when I'm going to America, this university chapter of that has invited me and this part of that organization has invited me. And then they send an email and they say, you know what? We're afraid people might protest. We're worried people might stand up against us. And you don't hear that because those are all the events that didn't happen. Those are all the people that didn't rally. But that stuff is so important and it compounds over time. And it's a battle that's so hard to know that it's even going on, but it is a battle just as real as any of the other ones that we're fighting. Right. Okay, so now tell us, 
advocacy. No, uh, you know, that's advocacy. Now, yeah. what, what's your wish list? Maybe some people across, listening can help you. Across our organization, again, it splits into these three major areas. And that's just my thought of there are huge problems in the world that need huge solutions. And I don't want to stop at small things. The world needs a lot of help. In the defense spectrum over the next year, it's really building out strong partnerships and relationships. And this is very specific within the Army, within engineering, within all of that, and getting the right people involved at the right places to build this out. We have a couple of solutions um, that are coming together right now and being implemented as we speak today. But more and more of those need to happen. There is a lot going on, and that's in the defense. And that's the one that's hardest for people to get actively involved in as you can imagine. Um, in the healing space, what we're doing over the next year that I think is really important is one, we're building out this space. Right now we operate two to three days a week. We wanna be operating four days a week. We wanna get this place to a spot where it could treat a couple of thousand people every single year. Well, um, um, and those clarify are, where, where, where the spot is. This is in Thailand. In Koh Phangan is where people are being treated and being helped and all of that. There are tons and tons of people who've reached out with clinical experience or this experience to offer help. Also, something really important that we're doing over there is longitudinal PTSD research. It's very, very important to note that we've gone through a different type of trauma. We've gone through collective trauma, and collective trauma requires collective healing. There are simply not enough psychologists and sociologists and all these people to help with the scope of the problem. So people need to start healing together. It's so important. And we plan on partnering up with other organizations, with universities over there to make sure that we could create a long form structure for research for that to not just help the people over there today, but create a template, create methodologies to help people tomorrow. Well, that's our goal over there to really build out the core of people who are coming, supporting them and the research required to really help in the long term. And then on the advocacy side, and this is where it's really incredible to see hundreds and hundreds of people reach out and continue to reach out and get engaged. If people are in a city in the U.S. and they want to start a chapter and they want to get involved, we're putting on events. And again, this is all aimed at younger people in particular to just get started and do something in the city um, where they're at. It's just about really being a Zionist and being passionate about Israel. Those networks build. And what we want to prevent is what I was talking about with that silence. It's scary to be out there in a sea of hate alone. But when we come together, it gets so much stronger. And that's really what matters is it's building that community from the ground up. And that really goes to every single person in America to become a part of that. Because it's hard. As October 7th gets further and further away, people are worried about their life and their job, and their husband or their wife, which they should be, but we can't forget. And we need to put in an active effort every single day to build these communities and to build that stuff up. And yeah. I, I think that you are amazing, is all I can say. And I particularly <laughs> liked the part about the defense, because I know that how hard it is in the United States to get anything innovative in the military. So even though that's something that most of us can't help you with, I think that's just beyond incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed also. I'm a psychologist of background, um, uh, specialized in uh, research on PTSD. So I, yeah. I, um, I, I very much admire the fact that, that, um, there, that, that science in, in this area, is um, is being helped um, yeah. by the people who are suffering from PTSD from this awful, awful uh, event of October seven. Um, yeah. that th that's a very, very noble thing uh, you guys are doing there. And I would ask on that subject because although I'm not a specialist, for several years I shared information for the U.S. military on PTSD, and I know that many people don't understand. You don't have to be in combat. Uh, trauma can be even from a car accident. How people can recognize, I recognized a friend had it from a domestic situation that's n not beating or anything. And when I was able to say to her, you have PTSD and get help, that changed things for her. So do you have a program to help people in Israel to recognize when people they know 
need help because as you just said, and let's repeat, the sooner you get help if you have PTSD, the better. Yeah, that's that's an incredible point. And, and the, the scope of that, of the amounts of people on just basic circles and numbers, 150,000 people in Israel were directly affected by the seven. 300,000 soldiers are being called up. Um, this this is something that affected essentially every single circle. And I remember this arriving at Nova site yesterday. You know, it's 630 in the morning. It takes an hour from a lot of places in Israel minimum to get there. I was thinking it was just going to be, you know, family, close friends, intimate, especially that early in the morning. But thousands of people were at Nova at 630 in the morning. And then it just kind of dawned on me that, no, those people are the family of friends. When you have a trauma that much and, you know, whether it's someone like me who lost a best friend or a family member or a sister or a brother or a mother or a father, there's so many of us who have been affected and 100 percent to be able to see who that is and get them the help in time is so important. And there are a ton of incredible programs in Israel that do help people and people need to find out and also be aware of this and that there should be no stigma against PTSD. It's completely okay. It happens. It's a reality of life and people need help and that's okay. And I think that's really the most important part of this of don't be afraid for anyone out there to say that and to seek help and to search help. And that goes all of us of just being aware of family members and friends in Israel and everything that's going on, that this is the reality that people are going through. So unless Evelyn has another question, because we have talked about what our listeners can do, which is what we always try to talk about. Do you have any last words that you would like to share with us before we end this incredible, incredible discussion? Um. I think just you mentioned that, you know, most of your your listeners are are in the States and I was not able to build this organization by myself. I was not able to do any of this by myself. It was with the support of tens, hundreds, literally thousands of people who've never met me, who were touched by David's story, who felt connected to what we were doing. And I think it's important for people to recognize the cumulative impact of everyone coming together, especially in America, where sometimes you might feel disconnected from what's going on or not directly involved in it. Every little thing that you do, whether it's supporting financially, whether it's getting involved in a community, it helps and it makes an impact. And people in Israel, they love it when people come and visit. They love it when people are involved. And I think from October 7th, one of the important takeaways for all of us is that we're united. We're one Jewish people in all of this, whether you're you're on this side or that side of the ocean. And we need to stand that way because that's how we'll be the strongest and we need to be the strongest now. Amen to that. So um, we cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. I thank our listeners for listening. Those of you who want to know more about Evelyn's work and my work, you can go to Never Again Is Now podcast at YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And please, as we end every show, we say, speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate.